um, for joining us in today's webinar, uh, Strengthening Hospitals' Best Practices in Managing COVID-19 Waste Without Incineration. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who's joining us uh, for this webinar right now. So what we prepared this afternoon are are, are different hospitals who will share um, their different best practices currently in dealing with um, COVID-19 related waste, as well as a discussion on why waste uh, incineration is not necessary in managing um, COVID-19 waste. Um, so this afternoon, the, the discussions will include um, discussions from the Philippines, Indonesia, and also Nepal. Um, so just to give you a brief background um, on COVID-19. So as of now, around the world, so globally, we have um, we're almost at 2.7 million uh, confirmed infections around the world. Uh, so specifically, that's 2,699,338. And we have recorded so far, um, unfortunately, 188,437 deaths around the world. Um, in Southeast Asia, um, as of yesterday, uh, we have around 33,000 uh, confirmed cases. Um, specifically in Indonesia, as of yesterday, we have around 7,400 um, confirmed cases and 635 deaths. In, in the Philippines, uh, we have recorded um, close to 7,000 cases or also and confirmed deaths of 462. In Nepal, um, amazingly, uh, they have only 45 confirmed cases. And more amazing is that they have uh, yet to record deaths in, in, in Nepal, which is very, very good. Um, um, so the problem now is that as we see, the burgeoning problem of all this infection around the world. And we have seen also how there's a big need for masks and other PPEs in all the hospitals that are dealing with um, hospital waste. Uh, I mean, in dealing with COVID-19 um, around the world. Um, at the end of the day, that means uh, there would be a lot of production of waste that are coming from the management of, of this disease. And there's been a lot of talks recently of how to manage this post-need or post-management waste of COVID-19, which would undoubtedly uh, collect a lot of PPEs after they've been, after they've been used. No? And unfortunately, here in the Philippines, for example, our very own Ministry of Environment is pushing for waste incineration, so which is why we're conducting um, this webinar today so that uh, we'll see if some of the hospitals uh, are, are best case hospitals who are practicing different, um, uh, different uh, management of waste in their own hospital uh, best practices are in need of incineration or not. Um, so before we go into that, um, I'd just like to uh, set some house rules uh, for our discussion this afternoon. So our panelists, we have four panelists uh, this afternoon, are allotted 15 minutes each uh, for their individual presentations. Um, they will be answering all your questions um, at the end of all the presentations. So nonetheless, you can uh, put in your questions at the chat box that you will see on your screen. And our um, technical staff will be taking notes of all your questions that you may address uh, to our panelists uh, later. And also, we will be recording our webinar this afternoon. And all of you who are interested to get a copy, uh, we can send you a copy of our webinar this afternoon. And also, I'd like to thank our friends from War on Waste Negros, who has helped us uh, uh, who work in cooperation with us uh, in circulating in, um, invitations, um, especially here in our country, in the region. So this afternoon's webinar 
is um, organized in cooperation with our friends from um, War on Waste Negros. So be before we go any further, I would just like to call in one of our my my co-presenter, uh, Krija Ayanige, of um, also um, health, uh, from Healthcare Without Harm Southeast Asia Office, who is also our coordinator for our Global Green and Healthy Hospital. She will introduce a little bit of our GGHH program for all of you. So, Krija. Yes, thank you. And um, hi everyone. I hope you're all safe and healthy. I'm once again Krija, and I'm the program coordinator for Global Green and Healthy Hospital Southeast Asia. So allow me to introduce GGHH. Global Green and Healthy Hospitals is a project of Healthcare Without Harm. So it is an international network of hospitals, healthcare facilities, health systems, and health organizations. It has 1,300 members in 63 countries who represents over 43,000 hospitals and health centers. GGHH members are dedicated to reducing their environmental footprint and promoting public and environmental health through its 10 sustainability goals. This includes waste, which is our topic for today. It also offers a variety of programs and benefits for its members, such as the GGHH Connect platform, Hippocrates database, healthcare climate challenge, and guidance document. To know more about GGHH, just go to greenhospitals.net or email us at greenhospitalsasia at hcwh.org. If you're not yet a member, we encourage you to join the GGHH network and together we'll build a more sustainable and resilient healthcare system for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tricia. So just uh, for this afternoon, um, our program will run as follows. So I will call in first our, our, our friend, the doctor from Indonesia, followed by Sister Asalita Sarnilio uh, from the Philippines, and then followed by Mr. Mahesh Nakarmi from Nepal. We're also inviting um, waste incineration, anti-waste incineration, uh, expert Dr. Jose Emanuel um, this afternoon. Um, so just to introduce some of our panels, uh, the next panel, uh, so I'd like to introduce Dr. H. Suherman. Um, Dr. Suherman is the chairman of the Indonesian Healthy Health Promotion, uh, Health Promoting Hospitals Network. He is also a member of the Asia Advisory Council of Healthcare Without Harm. Um, he obtained his master's in public health from Indonesia University. He served as director of our Samsudin SH General Hospital in Sukabumi City and was the head of the Indonesian Regional Hospital Association of West Java Province. So without further ado, I'd like you all to, I'd like to introduce to you all, uh, Dr. Suharma. Okay, so we're having a little bit of trouble. Um, so just to uh, keep the presentations going, so we'd like to call on first um, Sister Arce Sarnilio, whose presentation is ready already, um, already up. Um, so I'm introducing um, Sister Arce now. Um, so Sister Arce is a member 
of the Asia Advisory Council also of Healthcare Without Harm. Sister Arce is the administrator of the St. Paul Hospital in Iloilo. She started her ecological advocacy 14 years ago through solid healthcare waste management. This advocacy has expanded to holistic initiatives to care for Mother Earth, such as rainwater harvesting, Large. vermicomposting, recycling, chemical replacement, etc. Her undergraduate course was nursing, with graduate studies in nursing and hospital administration. So, again, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sister Arcelita Sarnili. Good afternoon and peace be to you all. I wish to thank Mr. Payang Lopez for inviting me to share in this webinar. Since the last quarter of 2019, the Philippines has been encountering some major disasters. On October 16, 2019, a 6.9 earthquake occurred in Mindanao, which affected many healthcare institutions. Until now, tremors are still felt sporadically in varying intensity. In January 2020, a dormant volcano in the southern part of the zone suddenly erupted, displacing thousands of families and hospitals were temporarily closed due to massive asphalt. And now, we have the COVID-19 pandemic, which came as a surprise to all of us. We are all unprepared. St. Paul Hospital Iloilo is not spared of this dilemma but we are resolute to face the challenge. This is our story. St. Paul's Hospital of Iloilo is now on its 109th year of existence. It's a level three training hospital situated in Iloilo City, in the island of Palai, Southern Philippines. We have established and functional hospital committees, among which are the Infection Control Committee and Waste Management Committee. We are mandated to accept COVID-19 patients along with other level 2 and level 3 hospitals for DOA circular of February 29, 2020. And so we actively participate in the Iloilo City COVID-19 task force. We immediately organized the SPHI COVID-19 task force headed by the chair of the Infection Control Committee and we developed guidelines to handle the situation. This is one of our meetings where we organized the committee. We put up the COVID-19 holding area in front of our existing emergency room. This is the triads area where comprehensive history taking and initial management is done. Baseline, chest x-ray, and CBC are also taken. Suspect cases are referred to the ICC chairman for proper management. This is our patient's holding area observing social distancing. We have also set up the COVID-19 unit with seven rooms. We installed CCTV per patient's room for monitoring purposes to minimize exposure of staff. Since it is considered as a highly contagious disease, Strict observance of proper waste management is important. One of our concerns is how to minimize waste generated in the unit. Our average waste per 24 hours, with also an average of five patients per day. For infectious, we had two kilos. It's composed of gloves, masks, diapers, plastics, two kilos consists of IV bottles, syringes, and other medical waste, with the paper and cartons, one kilo. These are for the food and medical supplies packaging. The contamination of waste of the COVID patients' rooms, we use the 10% sodium hypochlorite which are being sprayed before transporting to the material recovery facility. We also do to claiming our infectious waste before disposal to general waste. 
And we observe proper segregation of the OSPPs after dumping. This is the, the pin for the head cap, crown, and shoe cover for the used goggles and for the soiled linen. The PPEs are being reprocessed using 10% sodium hypochlorite, detergent soap, and water. There are four tabs referred here. The first tab is where the 10% sodium, sodium hypochlorite with detergent soap and water. The second tub, water plus 10% sodium hypochlorite. The third tub, water for the first rinsing. And the fourth tub, water only for second rinsing. All the PPAs were let dry under the sun in the open air. Initiatives for sustainability. We, sold, we made our own reusable PPAs for sustainability, economy, and environmental stewardship. This is to avoid the use of disposable PPAs. The personal protective equipment is made of silver taffeta cloth or the parachute material, which is a water repellent. Shoe pad is made of recycled old upholstery leatherette. In order to address scarcity of supplies, we maximize the use of surgical masks by inserting it in the customized washable cloth mask. These were given to the staff. We also provided hand washing area at the entrances before entering the hospital to minimize use of alcohol and hand sanitizers. Because of the lockdown, there were no transportation available, and so we provided transport service for our employees residing within the city. We also provided temporary staff dormitory for those living outside the city and where they have the prayer room where they can be quiet and commune with the Lord before or after their duty hours. Counseling and critical incident stress debriefing was also provided by our consultant psychiatrist. The CISD sessions helped alleviate fear, anxiety, and feeling of discrimination among those assigned in the COVID unit. What brought us to this situation? We know that nature will always take back on us. And I'd like to quote Pope Francis during an interview conducted last April 8, 2020. And he says, coronavirus pandemic is one of nature's responses to people ignoring the current ecological crisis. And so we need to renew our commitment to be responsible stewards of God's creation. We really do not know when will the situation end. Nevertheless, we need to plan for the future. So, moving forward, it is imperative that we should not let down our guard. We must maintain physical distancing provide separate patients' waiting area for the doctor's clinics, maintain process flow on entry of patients, visitors, and watchers, observe the rational use of PPEs, retain the use of the COVID-19 holding area for triaging of infectious cases like measles, pneumonia, and PTB, sustain hand hygiene facility and reiterate importance of respiratory etiquette. In conclusion, I'd like to quote Dr. Hans Hendrik Kuge, WHO Director of Europe. He says, any steps to transition towards a new normal must be guided by public health principles, together with economic and societal considerations. We learn better together. Thank you very much. Stay safe. God bless. 
Thank you very much, Sister Arce, for that very impressive uh, presentation on how the SPH, SPH, SPHI uh, has innovated to adapt to what COVID-19 is asking from all our um, health facilities. So now we jump in to Dr. Soherman, who I have earlier uh, already introduced. Um, just to let everyone know from uh, our participants that Dr. Sir Herman is having trouble connecting uh, to WebEx today because of the intermittent um, internet connection in Indonesia. So he will be phone patched uh, by our technical staff uh, patch. So just please let us know if you are having trouble hearing from his presentation. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to give the floor now to Dr. Soherman. Dr. Soherman, good afternoon. And thank you, Pat. I'm, I'm also happy to receiving the invitation from the Air Care with Art Asia that I should share about the uh, work Indonesian's uh, health promoting hospital. Uh, managing the COVID-19 hospital-related ways, you see. Uh, I think it is uh, very important for us because uh, nowadays the situation we are focusing how to uh, the take care about the issue on the COVID-19. But in other issue, I think it is a relevant topic uh, we have already discussing today. Okay, next. Next, Pat. Because we know that uh, Health Promoting Hospital Indonesia is uh, our uh, uh, introducing board because the, uh, we are maybe uh, a part of the uh, 600 uh, hospital related to the totally uh, 3,000 uh, 3, hospital in Indonesia to something about uh, 260 million people citizens in our Indonesia. And, and nowadays the situation about the 3,000 Hospital, we still looking for the uh, decreasing the number of beds in the hospital. So in this figure of the, uh, the uh, said the West Java province, you see with maybe 70, uh, 27 uh, district and city, we got uh, some uh, difficulty to find uh, beds in the hospital. So that's why this is the number of the beds and that shows the number of beds needed. You see, okay, the next presentation. So this is the issue on the uh, uh, our activity in Indonesia with FHVH. We know that uh, nowadays the situation we are moving uh, to the uh, uh, more on the five and zero revolution about the digitalization and uh, maybe uh, 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 internet of things. But uh, this is our issue on the HVH uh, activity. We usually uh, uh, supporting for the hospital uh, education, uh, hospital and educator uh, in the training for the preparation for the accreditation of the hospital. So I think uh, uh, we are talking here about the issue on the pandemic of the uh, COVID-19. And then hopefully maybe uh, our, uh, this is not only, uh, if we cannot separate it, this uh, the issue because the COVID is uh, impacting to the industry uh, 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 issue on Indonesia. Okay. And next. And this figure we look that maybe this is the uh, epicenter of uh, the first uh, causes of COVID in Indonesia in Jakarta. And then Jakarta is very, the most populated uh, uh, city in Indonesia. And then we are also uh, 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 make a scoring for the other province from the uh, 35 province in Indonesia. Uh, like so what in the in the left figure and then in the epicentrum of Jakarta we look the epidemic trend and basis to become more higher because we are uh, we are fails uh, in the first uh, periods of the uh, uh, tackling about the uh, COVID-19 in Indonesia so that's why our data figure Jakarta and also also Indonesia after the some of the city you have already looked down we now uh, the number of the case to become higher and maybe this is the problem of the rapid test for the beginning, you see, because we know that the rapid test is quite low at the beginning and then we started that idea and then we know that the uh, confirms and also the positive case of the uh, COVID to become more higher. And 
the other issue which was you see in the next uh, figure, you see the next figure, uh, but uh, you see that this is the uh, what they call the the, the 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 demanding of the hospital uh, because we look at the uh, epidemic uh, outbreak in Indonesia and also the uh, pandemic in our world, which is relevant with the uh, uh, the. Uh, requirement of the facility must be hospital, ICU, ventilator, and also maybe uh, other issue for the uh, barcode, uh, open all, and also other requirement for the issue. So this is the big group of Indonesia, and then this, uh, also we have only two options uh, in the beginning. So <coughs> the option, uh, the option one, the option two. We 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 uh, we thanks to the using the option two. Uh, uh, to fulfill about the uh, requirement because we have uh, for the beginning we have uh, from the, the 3,000 hospital uh, the, the Ministry of Health already choosing about 134 hospitals to become uh, hospital with a facility for the uh, isolation because uh, this issue but maybe nowadays it's just a quite uh, uh, different and the next the next uh, presentation uh, this is the issue because uh, since the beginning, Indonesia was difficult to uh, and more soundable about the issue on the uh, uh, barcode and the overall. Because you know that uh, when the China has the beginning uh, issue on the pandemic, they have already bring so many uh, barcode and over, uh, overcode from around the world and then they are putting for the preparation. And then when the uh, Indonesia voting this issue, okay. maybe uh, uh, all of the barcodes and also the overhead has already sold out, and there is no one in Indonesia. So it is a gender situation in Indonesia. So that's why uh, uh, one of the most uh, factor uh, contributing to the Indonesia is the highest uh, case fatality rate uh, from the efforts uh, professional uh, around the world. Maybe maybe it is uh, why that Indonesia is a uh, Good to to watch the uh, of uh, barcode and of photo because uh, uh, it is not protected. You see, not sufficient, not sufficient of the whole health professional uh, coding's uh, uh, relevance uh, uh, data. Because uh, maybe because of the uh, because of the uh, because of the uh, because of the uh, because of the 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 because uh, probably uh, for rights, uh, BBC, a project in the hospital. And then, uh, and then, other vision. And this is of the, uh, uh, what we call the before, before this, before this. Uh, this is the composition has already been published by the, by the, uh, publication specification. Then maybe, uh, contents of the, about what the upper is uh, the polyester, barbages, the jerry, and the polyester, but so this is a notice and a disclaimer from the not so many uh, barcode and open all is uh, safe for the uh, health professional. Next, and uh, some of the uh, some of the yeah uh, some of the barcode and open all is uh, modified because uh, the modified about the composition and the ingredient because. Sometimes it is it is not uh, sufficient, not confidence from the health professional using the barcode and operates like this one because it is very uh, with this very uh, uh, safe. You see in the situation so because we are staying in the uh, small room and then it is restricted and then we choose uh, maybe uh, for five to six hours. You see five to six hours uh, before we uh, take for other maybe uh, rest. Yeah. This is a, a proper example. Maybe using the uh, microporey because they would like to make a coating a polyethylene breathable yeah, to, uh, to 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 uh, find the solution. Okay, next again that. And in other aspects, maybe because the, the, the protocol from other uh, from the national policy uh, about the logistics, the registration pad, uh, hospital standard operational procedure protocol for guideline and and also in every step activities, we have already uh, this the good for a while. We know that it is very uh, late, you see, because uh, national standardization about the uh, guideline uh, for protecting uh, the 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 air personnel is uh, an ongoing process until now. I think that, but I think that the logistics uh, is very standard. But 
for the, the hospital uh, staff, it is uh, still uh, updating, upgrading from the portable guideline. Uh, mostly also for the uh, how to uh, mix uh, the, pro the process on uh, the process on maintaining uh, of the workload uh, and the overall is uh, still developed. Next uh, presentation. Uh, in other issue, you see uh, next next, uh, next uh, yeah. In other issue, it is uh, it's quite, uh, there is uh, in between the situation is quite uh, different. You see. While the fluctuation of incident, the new case of the COVID to become uh, to become more higher, but in other side there is we are uh, economic scaling up. There is some uh, uh, production, some publication is growing up, and some of the publication is going down. So it is a figure. Maybe maybe uh, the likes from the medical uh, supplier and services is to become uh, growing up uh, economic scaling. Uh, we know that uh, every district, every province have a new cases, uh, mostly the positive and confirmed. Because nowadays, uh, the uh, standard on WHO is about the not rapid test, but also for the uh, PCR, you see this terminal method. Okay, next presentation. Uh, I would like to show to you, this is maybe the, our concern. This is one of the big observations by the, <coughs> the uh, Samsung Hospital in Chukabumi. With uh, 800 bed, 800 bed, and maybe 2,000 uh, have uh, personnel, maybe we showed in the figure that maybe the uh, uh, infectious uh, hospital waste to become more higher you see, day by, uh, month by month, and maybe after uh, months that the numbers of the uh, COVID uh, waste is to become more higher. So this is the figure on uh, how the Hospital with uh, 800 bed and also with 2,000 uh, hospital staff, uh, 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 what we call, uh, they uh, all waste like this month. And then this is mostly also mostly for the hospital because the hospital should pay uh, more more higher than uh, the, the, the domestic hospital waste like that one. And the other issue, maybe because the uh, 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 Dollar currency is to become more higher. It is maybe uh, costing uh, work uh, uh, beds, uh, for the financial hospital liquidity because this is a big one like that one. And the next figure, and other issue is about the uh, how to uh, incinerator on top club. Now in the situation in Indonesia, so many hospitals has already uh, putting uh, out the incinerator for the hospital. So they some of the hospital has using the auto club. You see. But in case of the Samsung in the hospital, in the two months uh, after they the, uh, receiving for the COVID uh, patients, maybe they still using for the reuse, uh, uh, reuse uh, for the protection barcode. For example, they reuse for the 282 pieces of helmets, and then they don't even reuse for the 167 pieces for the Google Glass, and also 287 pairs of the boot shoes. Then they using the high concentrate disinfectant for one hour, and then maybe uh, then using the plasma concentrate and maybe dry. Uh, this is this is the situation of the hospital. Uh, maybe uh, this is one of the biggest uh, in the West Java uh, as a case. Uh, I have already uh, got the data, the, 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 the updating data, and the last maybe presentation. It is also the last presentation. Uh, in other issue, it is uh, issue of the uh, because nowadays the case fatality rate in Indonesia uh, for more of our personnel to become higher. Maybe the rate of among 7.4 to 12.4 uh, uh, case fatality rate in Indonesia. They also the problem is how about the dying patients, you see, and mortality because we know the uh, quarantine uh, regulation among uh, the situation. It's very difficult. Some of the citizens uh, didn't want right to receive for the dying and mortality for the COVID situation. So it is also the problem, not only for the barcode and also the overcoat and other, uh, but also the for the situation. So this is the situation in Indonesia now about uh, how to uh, uh, to maintain and to uh, take care uh, for the uh, COVID-19. I think this is the short result. And then uh, in the other side, maybe here, uh, there's so many professionals because 
some also difficulty the other side the health professional has already uh, has already keeping up for the the, uh, the patient but the other side <laughs> when the hospital has died it is difficult to go uh, for the for the uh, place for the military like say what so they not uh, rest in peace in this situation but they should uh, looking for the uh, other place for the rest that they uh, in peace this is uh, my presentation i hope that it will be uh, discussed in the uh, uh, next uh, situation and uh, i hope that it is valuable for us to discuss thank you Peng, and uh, thanks for uh, the presentation uh, thank you so much Thank you so much, um, Dr. Sir Herman. So it's looking like a lot like the, the situation in Indonesia is not so different from the situation here in the, the Philippines. So all the challenges that you're currently facing, we're facing as well. Um, and yeah, I hope that this afternoon we'd be able to, you know, cross pollinate and learn some new um, innovations so that we together um, all of us can move forward and solve all these problems but we now jump to uh, Nepal as I have said who has uh, so far has an impressive record in containing the virus so as again so as yesterday um, Nepal only has um, 45 um, confirmed cases of um, virus COVID-19 virus infection and zero deaths. Um, so to tell us more about uh, Nepal, I'd like to introduce to all of you uh, Mr. Mahesh Takarmi. Uh, so Mahesh is a co-founder and the executive director of Healthcare Foundation Nef Nepal 360. So that's HECAF 360. Um, he, is, uh, he has a civil engineering background. He has made a career of health helping South Asian governments, as well as international and Nepali institutions prepare and respond to natural disasters and other mass casualty events. Mahesh is also a co-founder of the National Society for Earthquake Technology and the HECAP's National Kidney Center. At NKC, he pioneered healthcare waste management program, which has been singled out by the uh, World Health Organization, the WHO, as a model in approaching the problems of medical waste, especially in developing countries. He's also WHO's Certified Mass Casualty Management Instructor. So to give us uh, more updates on Nepal, I'd like to give you all to Mahesh. Good afternoon, Mahesh. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you, Pang, Pat. And all healthcare director I'm family, healthcare family. And thank you, Sister Anilita, Swerman, and uh, um, panelists, and uh, all the participants. I think all of you are in lockdown. So it's happy to talk from home uh, and do a, a share you some of our experience of Corona COVID 19. Uh, as Pang said, that we have. We have uh, till now we have only 48. Till yesterday evening it was 48 cases. Uh, there was no 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 person in ICU. No no death at the moment. Thanks God. So we have almost like a easy easy thing. But we don't know when it will will be increased or I don't know. We are taking all the measures from the government. But here I, I will be not be able to talk about the more on the hospital side the COVID-19 response on waste management, I will rather present you a, a, a first phase of the COVID-19 waste where we are bringing our, recruiting our Nepal citizen from Wuhan, China, the epicenter of COVID-19. Uh, so that was a, a big exercise we have carried out. It was in the, in the second week of February. It was, at that time, it was not a, not a declared as a global pandemic. So, in a, so it was. We have a. We are very much concerned about the uh, concern about the waste at time also. So the government has requested us to help uh, to manage the waste from the the flight that was 
guys nepal airlines nepal airlines flight from uh, from wuhan to kathmandu and to take uh, to manage all the waste because we are thinking that some of them will be contaminated can you have next slide please next slide hello hello Hello. Mahesh, you may you may click. Next, oh, I can click. Yes. Where I can click, I don't know. Next, uh, the arrow on your key keypad keyboard. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Okay, let me let me. Can you do it for me? Okay, this is my, our HECAF SST COVID response team for waste management. And we are ready. At that time, it was ready to move. So we are making our move. So this is a photograph of the group. Next, please. Uh, before uh, doing this uh, work, we, we have we have made a thorough analysis of the of the waste generation points during the from Corona evacuation to the to the quarantine of the passengers. So we have a different phases of waste generation points. Like first, waste will be generated in the aircraft. Second, the air, uh, second, it will be uh, generated in the bus where the passenger will be taken to the quarantine station. And third, there may be in the waste generation in the ambulances. So we have thoroughly analyzed the point of waste generation and uh, developed the system for each of them. And so this is the, just an infographic diagram of how where the waste is being generated and how, the, how the, it will be taken care of that. So that was a, a basically a, a concept of the waste management plan. Next, please. So before doing this job, PPE was very important. So at that time, we didn't have much PPE available in Nepal. So we thought that we need to have a better PPE. So, so we have made a request to the, our partners, international partners. And one of our international partners from Switzerland has, uh, has sent us the around 400 uh, PPEs, proper PPEs. And these PPEs we hand over to the government of Nepal, Ministry of Health, and hospitals. And also we have got uh, get, get uh, we have used ourselves also those PPEs. It was a very good PPE we got from Switzerland. And you can see this is a handover process. Next, please. Uh, so first of all, we have to do internal preparation. So after uh, we are requested to do this job, we have been this having a series series of. Uh, meeting and uh, training for our staff and because it was a new virus no one knows what are the precautions, what are the consequences of these viruses at that time so we are very much curious uh, we have so we have we are doing this preparation of a whole staff team of a cap 60 next please so we have developed our own label uh, with the biohazard symbol and uh, all the necessary information in the about this waste and uh, also we have put the identification number of each biohazard containers to track the waste. This is the uh, design of the container and the labels, everything is here. Next, please. So before using this container, we have put uh, every container we have put inside the uh, testing indicators. At that time, we have not sure that how we are going to treat, but our concern was non not non incinerated method. So our concern was to do autograving. So for that, what we did, we put the, every container we put inside the testing indicators, biological spores, chemical indicators. <coughs> so every each and each drum was equipped with those indicators so that we can see whether after autograve it is it is properly uh, sterilized, uh, disinfected or not. That was our concern. So we made a very much effort on that putting the chemical indicators and biological spore in each of the biological content inside. Next, please. So um, the containers were 80 liter containers. Uh, it was 80 liter containers and it was puncture proof and lead and also lockable. So this container was installed every, st every stages of the, uh, uh, installed in every stages concerning the infection transmission. Wherever the passenger will touch Wherever the passenger will sit, wherever the passenger will move, we have considered everything. It is from Wuhan to uh, the quarantine site in Nepal. We have considered every point. So we have made all, all, um, uh, all 
all places like inside aircraft, ambulance, bus, in the ground, aircraft for aircraft cleaning. So everything is considered. So these are the number of what we these are around 66 containers were used. And we have done all this uh, numbering, coding for the stacking of waste. Next, please. So we did a training for ambulance staff on uh, on, on the in the PP use of PPE and waste of waste collection, all the things and uh, the staff, the ambulance staff, the boss boss staff, boss which are transporting from the front inside. We are taking all, all these vehicles, all these ambulances are taken as the infected uh, vehicles, in contaminated vehicles and contaminated ambulances, contaminated things, everything as one. So we did disinfection of those, we did, did proper thing with the staff of the ambulances and buses and all the staff inside the airport, the plane and the air crew, everyone is well trained and well oriented on this. Next, please. So we have went to because it was a first time this is happening in the in the, because every time there was the, maybe the contaminated contaminated passengers are traveling in the airlines but this was taken as a serious thing because it's a coronavirus so thinking that all aircraft will be contaminated so in that context we have a very serious meeting with the airlines management team airline staff and we inside the crew with the crew everyone. And we give them our plan, and so they won our plan, and we we did accordingly. Before that, they were thinking that they will take their they, they are going to burn this waste. So we stopped them to burn it. We stopped them to use the plastics. So we we are trying to make a, a minimize of waste and proper waste management as per the standard uh, standard of the uh, waste management. Next, please. So we we after our plan brief the management we went to talk to the crew members we we have in, visited inside the inside the plane and we have we have we briefed them we, with the, the aircraft is divided into two area clean area and dirty area so in the in that way so and we put the waste uh, we do not we do, so we we try to find out the space to put the other container in, inside the aircraft like that. So this is how we did. We are we are very closely working with the airline staff and crew members very closely, and uh, we are bringing them in the in the uh, in the our in our conversation very closely. We are with everyone involved in this process: the army, the police, the uh, armed police force. Everyone is involved in this process. So it was a really a very big exercise. Next, please. So the flight was taken in the uh, 20th, uh, actually February 15. It was flew to one and February 16 in the morning. It was it was back. So it was four hour flight actually. So there were 175 Nepalese were uh, here, and where assumption was that the, uh, there will be some of the passenger will be corona infected passenger among the 175 passenger who are getting from Corona epicenter city of one China. But we don't know who, who who is in contaminated. So we are taking every passenger is contaminated. So the aircraft chamber is divided in two parts, two areas. From front part, cockpit and business class was a clean area. Were allocated for cabin crew, airline staff, medical team. There was a medical team was the, went there to receive them. And then the uh, back part was economic economic class area where dirty area were located and only for the isolation of the passenger only. There were only passengers, 170 passengers were there. So in two area we have we didn't uh, the crew member was not allowed to go to the dirty area and serve the food water nothing just to give them instruction by the PA system announcement system so it was totally uh, uh, isolated totally uh, differentiated between two areas and all the food packets were kept in in its seat but initially there was long discussion where the food should be given or not but. As per airlines rule, they have to give the food because it's a four hour flight. But our concern was not to give food to reduce the waste, but they didn't allow it. So later, uh, they were supposed to pack this, all this food packet in the plastic bags, the Ziploc bags. They said no, because if you put a Ziploc bag the, during autocraving process, the, it may be not disinfected. So we, we, have, we convinced them to put in the paper bag. It was a long discussion. It took a long time to ask to convince them why it is necessary to put in paper bag. So we reduce the plastic use, avoid, avoiding the plastic use there, and we we try to 
we try to uh, we try to um, avoid those wastes and uh, so food food was given in the paper bag and the clear instruction were given in return as well as announced regularly during the flight how should they put their waste where should they should take their waste everything was clearly in mention and by other containers were installed just one, one side of the area of airplane packing by other uh, containers were installed outside the outside the aircraft when they come out of the aircraft they were taken the temperature uh, by the, the by the temperature uh, the thermometer and then they they have to take all their waste back to the outside to the aircraft and put in the it's by other container dump their waste container and when it is two thirds full we, we we lock it the lid and we seal it and lock the container next please so um, so everyone was is carrying the uh, inside the aircraft there was some waste generated inside the aircraft so the crew member is bringing outside you can see in the photograph it's bringing outside the aircraft and uh, next please and all can you go back can you go back please can you go back sorry back please oh, back 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 side back no not front back yes yeah. So you can see in a black photo, it was taken by a reader. We have not, we are not allowed to take photo due to the contamination risk. So it was a photo is taken from very far from reader newspaper, reader news agency. And you can see in the two yellow people are one of right side one is myself. I was there and in the, in the ground, there were a lot of biohazard drums containers are there where the passengers were keeping those waste in the containers. So it was very only one photo available from this news agency. And you can see the two yellow, yellow uh, people there. One was the doctor who taking the doctor to the we taking care of the passengers, and uh, myself was the right side taking care of the waste. So these are the way how we did it. It was night time. There was no not in daytime because people were havoc to. So it was just to avoid those things in that. So can you go in the next next slide, please? Besides this, this was the containers from the air, air, air inside the air, aircraft. So it was taken out by the aircraft staff. Were fully uh, fully covered by PPEs, properly used by PPEs. Next, next, please. So, in outside the aircraft, the, these waste were generated. So you can see all these containers were leaked, uh, leak, leak, locked and sealed, and. and and there were some uh, some waste was outside which we we later we we make it uh, in the contain contain the container by the container next please so then there was a meeting in the ministry of health and population about what how should we do the treatment because there was no guideline at that time so everybody was concerned that what to do with these waste uh, and the airlines, the aircraft authority didn't allow to keep out their waste long time because it may be risks for other other um, risks due to risk. So we were we were presenting our concept to the Secretary of Ministry of Health, where he has agreed to our concept and he has given us go on and go further for the thing. So next please. So it has, it gives us great opportunity. So these are the collected collected by other containers which which we need to which we need to do the treatment. So uh, uh, next please. So uh, before taking these uh, these containers to the waste treatment, we did a pre-treatment by using the uh, disinfection spray of the outer outer side of the uh, by other containers. So this is a spraying is going on in each each container. Next please. Next slide. So this is the uh, chemical we use, which was which is a uh, European Union certified uh, chemical. Uh, it was good for the actually it was not for COVID that time. There was no 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 such treatment disinfection, but we took it for the SARS and and other 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 those similar corona related uh, waste uh, in, uh, disinfection chemicals. We did it and it, it was it was uh, we we made and we made display of this. Next please. 
Then, uh, as per decision of the ministry, we have chosen three hospitals where the waste could be treated, as they have a proper autoclaving facility. And so we have um, selected these hospitals, and we we have selected the dates from when to where we, we should do these things. So next next slide, please. So we have a national kidney center. We we went there and we keep all the waste. We all bring all these uh, containers and we make a autograving inside like this. And then uh, we this is a national kidney center. Next please. Next please. This is in uh, Kathmandu Medical College Hospital. They also have a autoclave, proper autoclave of doing this. This is a, this autoclave is a all these autoclaves are the specially made for medical waste. These are pre vacuum autoclave. And it is automatic autoclaves, and it was very good autoclave using it. And we did all this waste inside this waste in the, after the hospital shift. Uh, hospital shift is I actually finished around six o'clock for the waste management. Then we started after six. So we did it till midnight. All these waste treatment process. Next please. So this is another TU teaching hospital. So all these uh, places are uh, we 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 did waste uh, only in the night time. After the uh, finishing the shift of the hospital, we took it for that hour. So all all was monitored by us. All was uh, all was operated by our our instruction. So we are the one who is we we with which we uh, plan and manage this waste for the government of Nepal. The so next please. So all these waste has been quantified. We have been taken out separately. We have been quantified this waste, what waste, how much waste, and we have a lot of lesson learned. We have been quantified. We have done the, all this uh, waste uh, quantification and waste categorization. Next, please. Uh, we also have the check the testing indicator because we kept all these indicators. We check it, and uh, we checked all those testing indicators whether it is passed. Fail everything. Next, please. These are tested indicators which we kept inside the waste. Taken out, we have recorded those. Yeah. Next, please. So, quantification of waste. You can see the waste categories now. What is uh, what is food waste? What is uh, water bottles? You know, thick paper, thin paper, recyclable plastic. All, all the things we have like mask, boots. You know, PPE, everything you got. You are all mixed. So we have taken all waste as a contaminated waste. We did all the waste. We have this kind of, we have, we have a very good lesson learned uh, that uh, with the food, uh, most of the food was not 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 consumed by the passengers, but they were they were they were in they were in actually anxiety. They were in they and they were very much. Uh, uh, I mean, they were in the. Uh, one this locked up area, so they, no one knows what is locked up during that time. So they were in very trauma, psychosocial trauma. So they were not consume most of the food. So actually, what we what we asked uh, airlines not to provide food was a, a good lesson from us. Uh, we learned that the food is not important during that time. It was a very short flight, four hour flight is not long. So that was the lesson learned we have. So we have other lesson learned. So this is a major lesson learned we got. So can you have next next one, please? Then the, these all these process were properly uh, monitored by Minister of Health and Population on all lo all sites. Uh, the official from the ministry, officials from the Minister of Health and Population were visited during the process of this autoclaving process, and they all are happy and with us about this process with what we done. Next, please. So then this this is this waste is transferred to the municipal waste uh, stream. So municipal municipal vehicle is collecting these waste and they are taken to the landfill uh, as for landfill disposal because it was all though this was uh, autoclave properly, but yeah, we thought that it was good to send to landfill rather than sending for recycling. So we all this waste can send to landfill. Um, next please. So thank you. This is our presentation. Uh, I'm thank to director from SCA office, uh, Peng, and uh, and all our colleague panelists, and also Hore, uh, also, uh, 
I'm thankful to all of you, and I'm very happy to be part of this. From ACAP 360, I would like to thank you and hope we'll, 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 we'll win the coronavirus soon. We'll be out of this crisis very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mahesh. Uh, it's very impressive how you uh, tried to close all the gateways of the coronavirus, starting from yeah, your, your airline. So, yeah, so yes. it's very impressive. Um, so I'm sure a lot of our participants have questions uh, that they're excited to ask, but I'm I'm begging you to be a little more patient. So we have one more um, presenter. And I hope you can use the lower right corner of your screens where you can punch your your questions uh, for our uh, panelists this afternoon. Um, so uh, let's uh, hear our next presenter. He is Dr. Jorge Emanuel. So Dr. Emanuel is a an adjunct professor at Seliman University in Dumaguete, Philippines. Uh, from 2003 to 2015. He was the chief technical advisor for global environment projects of the UNDP program specializing in infectious waste and hazardous waste. He was also an advisor for the WHO, U.S. National Institute of Health, U.S. EPA, World Bank, Swiss Red Cross, and other agencies. During his last, so, okay, so. During his last six yes, months but. with the UN, Oops. He led the team to Africa at the height of the Ebola crisis to conduct trainings in infection control and install medical waste treatment technologies that he helped design in South Africa. He is also the author or co-author of two dozen UN and WHO guidelines and led the development of 25 training modules on medical waste management translated into several languages for WHO and UNDP. He has also written several books, including the WHO's main reference guidelines on healthcare waste and the, UN, the UNEP's uh, main reference on medical waste treatment technologies, and two healthcare without harm books on non burn technologies. He was part of the team that developed the STAATT criteria on microbial in inactivation and the guidelines for the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants. He also helped develop the Philippine Department of Health's Healthcare Waste Management Manual and manuals for other countries as well. His training is in chemistry, chemical engineering, environmental science, public health, and infection control prevention. Everyone, um, I give to you now uh, Dr. Jorge Emanuel. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, uh, Pats, maybe you can nod your head if you can hear me. Um, yes, no. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers, um, and I hope everybody's staying safe. And it's all it's good to see uh, uh, Sister Arce, and good to see Mahesh after so many years, and to hear about the good work we're, you're doing. Um, I'd like to talk about. Uh, the issue of incineration, but before doing so, I need to talk about how do we inactivate uh, the SARS uh, coronavirus 2. Um, this is my most important message. The SARS CoV 2, which is the coronavirus that is responsible for COVID 19, is among the easiest uh, pathogens to destroy. Um, and so let me illustrate this with this. Um, let me see, I, I hope I'm not blocking much of my screen uh, with this slide. Uh, this shows you different microorganisms and we rank the microorganisms based on how resistant they are to be uh, destroyed, uh, killed or inactivated through heat or through chemical disinfection. At the very top of the list are the uh, microorganisms that are the hardest to destroy. These are called the prions. Uh, these are prion particles, protein particles, and they're responsible for uh, things like the Kutzfeld Yakub disease, Baca disease, and so on. These are extremely difficult. I spent years uh, trying to find ways to destroy them. Um, and then next to this are the bacterial spores. These are endospores, 
uh, such as Jubacillus thermophilus, uh, Bacillus atrophius, which is to be called Bacillus subtilis, and so on. Um, uh, in one of Mahesh's slides, I think he was using Bacillus sterothermophilus, which is the common one we use to test autoclaves. And from the name sterothermophilus, thermophilus means it loves heat, which means it's not very easy to kill, uh, either with heat or with chemicals. We use it for testing. Um, uh, next are the uh, uh, poxidia, like cryptosporidium. Then the next difficult ones are the mycobacteria, like the mycobacteria that uh, gives us tuberculosis, mycobacteria terrae, and all the others. And then um, below that, easier to destroy. In other words, prions are the hardest, and the bacterial spores. Then going down the list are the non-lipid viruses, like polio, uh, virus, norovirus, and so on. And then below that, a little bit easier than the non-lipid viruses are fungi, like aspergillus or candida albicans and so on. And then below that, easier, much easier to kill are the vegetative bacteria, like Staph aureus, Pseudomonas, Streptococcus, E. coli, and so on. And then the easiest to kill of all the microorganisms are the lipid viruses. And the list there shows you the famous lipid viruses, HIV, hepatitis B, influenza virus, the Ebola virus, and all the coronaviruses, which is why even before uh, we had studied the uh, corona, I mean the uh, COVID-2, uh, the virus responsible for COVID-19, we already knew that it would be very easy to kill because it is a lipid virus. And all the studies we've done on all the past coronaviruses, um, OC43, uh, 229E, all the other well-known coronaviruses, the first SARS virus, all of these were easily destroyed. So, um, oops, I lost. Doctor, can you can you share your yes. screen, doctor, for your ah, presentation? Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, so now let's look specifically at um, what can destroy coronavirus. Uh, as I already mentioned, it's easy to destroy, so it's easily destroyed by bleach. And in the recent studies specific to COVID-2, uh, we find that uh, if you use just 1% or even 2% uh, or even 1% of bleach, you can destroy it within five minutes, actually well within five minutes. Uh, and that's why it's recommended that you use at least 1% bleach for blood spills in a hospital. And between 0.5 to 0.1, Percent of bleach would be good for general disinfection. The box you see on the right are some of my references. And if you're doing general cleaning, 0.45% bleach for 10 minutes is good enough. If you have highly contaminated linens like bed sheets and so on, all you have to do is a very dilute bleach solution, 0.05% bleach, or soak it in 30 minutes, and that's enough to destroy the coronavirus. Now, keep in mind the only thing you have to be careful is that. If you have heavy organic matter in your waste, such as body fluids, vomitus, fecal matter, and so on, you will need to use higher percentages because organic matter inactivates bleach itself. And then there are other things that you have to be careful to, as shown at the bottom. Now, the other disinfectants that could kill coronavirus are alcohol. At 70% ethanol, it's killed within five minutes if you soak it in ethanol. At 50% isopropyl alcohol, it's killed in about 10 minutes. That's not based on COVID-19, but it's based on the other coronaviruses. It's probably going to be the same. At 0.5% hydrogen peroxide, you destroy it in 10 minutes, uh, studied with the other coronaviruses. And then you can see the other disinfectants uh, there at the bottom. Um, I want to uh, make sure people are also aware that the one, we don't think of it as a disinfectant, but the one thing that destroys coronaviruses very easily is simple soap. It's the reason why we keep telling people to wash your hands with soap, rub it thoroughly in, in all surfaces for about 20 seconds, because we know it will destroy the coronavirus. Um, and so uh, 
tests that have been done using very high titers, very high amounts of the virus, were put uh, left in 2% soapy water, that's fairly dilute soap, soapy water. And after five minutes, there were uh, some viruses detected in some samples, but the, all the others did not. But the, by 10%, there were no longer any viruses detected. And the reason for that has to do with the, the, the chemistry of soap. If you look at the coronavirus, there's a picture there on the left, and it shows that the coronavirus is a lipid virus, a lipid envelope virus. That means it has an envelope. You can see it's sort of uh, orange and, and brown and so on. And th this uh, envelope here is made of lipids, and sticking out of it is the, a spike protein. And if you look at what a soap molecule looks like, there's a, hydro, a hydrophilic head, which loves water, and a, a lipid, a lipophilic tail, which likes the, um, the lipids. And so what happens is that, um, let me see, I lost control again. Uh, let me see if I can get back. Okay, and so when you uh, mix soap, soapy water with coronavirus, the tail ends up breaking open the coronavirus, the lipid envelope of the coronavirus, and it releases all that RNA and all the other uh, remnants. And then as you can see on the right here, the other interesting uh, property of soap is they form mycelles. And these mycelles basically surround uh, pieces of the virus so that they're completely inactivated. So soap is a perfect, and uh, detergents are perfect for destroying coronavirus. Now, in terms of temperature, uh, based on laboratory studies, on a cool day, the coronavirus will inactivate itself within two weeks, sometime within two weeks. On a hot day at 37 degrees, it will inactivate by itself within two days. And in hot water, like at 56 degrees centigrade and at 70 degrees centigrade, that's hot water, that's not even boiling, at 56 degrees, it gets destroyed within 30 minutes. At 70 degrees, it's destroyed within five minutes. At boiling water, based on my estimates, it will be destroyed in a matter of seconds. This is in boiling water. So if 1% bleach or 70 degrees centigrade, which is not even boiling, can inactivate the SARS-CoV-2 virus in five minutes, then that means that 5% bleach or 10% bleach will completely uh, deactivate it. That also means that microwave units that operate at close to 100 degrees will destroy it. Eichelin hydrolysis, obviously, which is the only technology I, I found that can destroy the prions, will obviously destroy the coronavirus. Uh, and it will be destroyed by dry heat, by hydroplaves, and by autoclaves, by the technology that was shown by Mahesh. I know this technology exists in centralized systems like safe waste in Pampanga or Pasi in Cebu, where they have large versions of this, destroy them from different hospitals, they will be completely destroyed. Uh, I know St. Paul hospitals, uh, many Sister Arces hospitals have their own autoclaves. Autoclaves are more than uh, enough to destroy the coronavirus. In fact, when we test the autoclaves, we use Geobacillus thermophilus. I told you that's in the second to the last of the list, but very hard to kill. And uh, when I helped develop the stat criteria showed in the bottom, uh, if we can destroy it by four logs, that means it's uh, more than enough to destroy the coronavirus. Um, so if we can destroy it uh, at temperatures that are not even at boiling, um, then why do we need an incinerator that operates at 850 degrees centigrade or 1200 degrees centigrade? Uh, not only is this overkill, but the use of incinerators will actually worsen the situation. Now, why do I say that? It's because uh, of the emissions of an incinerator. When you use an incinerator, you release particulate matter, you release carbon monoxide, you release acid gases like hydrogen chloride, hydrogen chloride. You re release heavy metals like arsenic, cadmium, chromium, mercury, lead, and so on. 
uh, and you release a lot of toxic organic compounds. And you'll notice that many of these are respiratory pollutants. In other words, SARS is a severely acute respiratory syndrome type of a virus, and yet the incinerator releases pollutants that make it very difficult for our respiratory system. In addition, the ash of an incinerator is also toxic. And I will just spend an extra slide to discuss one of the toxic organic compounds shown in the dot you see, and these are the dioxins. Now, the, um, uh, well, first let me mention here, I give you examples of what these incinerator pollutants can do, what their health impacts are on the body. And as you can see, many of them impact our lung functions, our respiratory tract, our cardiovascular system, all the things that are also attacked by the coronavirus. But dioxin is especially bad because it's one of the most toxic chemicals known to science. Uh, it's not nothing that we normally would produce, but it is created by incinerators. And uh, dioxins are known to uh, cause cancers. Uh, like soft tissue sarcoma, uh, certain types of leukemia, and so on. It causes reproductive effects, like reduced sperm count on males, reduced fertility for women, and so on. It causes birth defects, congenital birth defects, uh, impacts ch children's learning, and it suppresses the immune system that we need desperately to survive the coronavirus. And worse yet, it remains in the environment for hundreds of years. And uh, dioxin that's released by the incinerators we end up uh, taking into the body, not so much by inhalation, although we get a little bit of that by inhaling it, but most of it to meat, fish, milk, and eggs because of its bioconcentrating factors, by accumulating factors. And so uh, on the picture on the right, you see a study that came out a few years ago where they took uh, samples of eggs around an incinerator. This is in the Netherlands. And within a five kilometer radius, they found out that the eggs within five kilometers of these farms and households that had their own chickens, the eggs had high levels of dioxin. That's the impact of incinerators. There's also the problem of the dioxin limits. So I will just mention my two red points. Most countries do not have the technical capacity to sample and test for dioxins, which means that we, most developing countries, cannot enforce dioxin limits which are required. We cannot even test if an incinerator can really meet these dioxin limits. And secondly, because of all the ash, most countries, most developing countries do not even have hazardous waste landfills. The chart on the bottom right just goes to show that we need to do continuous monitoring of dioxins. Um, this is a, a chart from a Belgian incinerator. Well, when they test the dioxin every day, they found out that 96 days out of the year, it was exceeding the limit by as much as 40 times. And yet the Philippines, Nepal, Indonesia, I'm sure, none of our countries have the capability to do continuous testing for dioxin. Therefore, incinerator pollutants will impact the health and environment of our surrounding communities, and they will further compromise the health of COVID-19 patients in the communities and in the hospitals. That's why I say it will make the situation worse. And so what do we do with waste? What our colleagues have shared is exactly what we need to do. We just need to follow the basic standard procedures. It's easy to destroy. So if we follow rigorous segregation, proper handling, collection, transport, and storage, we make sure we have the right PPE. And I list the type of PPE in my second arrow bullet point from the WHO uh, uh, guidelines, mask, face shields, heavy gloves, long sleeves, gown, and boots for the people dealing with waste. And finally, let's use the safe and environmentally sound treatment technologies, such as those listed here, such as those used by Mahesh in Nepal, by Sister Arce and her hospitals in the Philippines, and others, uh, the autoclaves, and so on. But let us not use incineration, which will make the situation worse. Thank you to all. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Jorge Emanuel. That was certainly uh, an eye-opener for me, especially the discussions on how different levels of alcohols can 
uh, still kill uh, the virus, especially soaps. No? Uh, soaps are, it's, it's amazing how our groceries are running out of alcohols in their racks, but you know, we're ignoring the simple fact that something as cheap as sure. our soaps no, can help us sure. avoid um, avoid uh, being infected by the COVID virus in the first place. So there, I know there are lots of questions um, for uh, from our participants this afternoon, um, and I'd like just to remind that we're also recording uh, the discussions today. So if you miss um, any of the discussions, we'll be sending you a link to the recordings. Also, uh, we'll try to make all the presentations of our panelists this afternoon available for every one of you to be able to access. So, yeah. Um, so for questions uh, this afternoon, I'm now calling on Pat, who, have, who has been taking notes of your questions. Um, Pat, are we ready? Okay. Um, so for for the for the questions, first we have our first question is for um, Mr. Arce. So the question is, um, uh, may I ask if you encountered? any challenges communicating with patients about uh, reusable PPEs used by healthcare workers? Yeah, actually, Pat, I made a uh, written note already of Connie. Uh, somehow we never encountered challenges uh, explaining to the patients because they know that uh, the, the healthcare workers need to protect themselves especially when handling uh, infectious cases, infectious patients. And uh, in particular, for this uh, coronavirus, it has become so sensationalized, so to say, and it really uh, creates so much fear with everybody. And so the, the need to protect. So we use all these kind of PPEs. In fact, I'd like to so that question supposed to to Dr. Jorge later. I'd like to ask Dr. Okay, thank you, sister. There's another question. Um, where did you get the material for the washable PPE? How did you select this material compared to others? And what yeah. were the criteria? Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, password we. Uh, what we were looking for was a material, an, an impermeable, non non permeable material. Uh, in fact, when we really started for looking for PPEs, the first thing that came to our mind was the raincoat. It's a plastic. But of course, uh, we, as I said, we need to be sustainable. So our infection control nurse is very, um, say, uh, she really find methods of where to, to look for a material. And we found it in an upholstery shop. So it's, a, as I said, it's a tafita, the parachute material, like the, the material, uh, a thicker material for that, the umbrella. So it's non-permeable and it's easy to wash also. All right, thank you very much. Um, the next question is um, for Dr. Suherman. Yes, sir. All right, uh, Dr. Suherman, the question is, um, sorry, I have to look for it again. Um, here, um, would you please elaborate on the role of HPH Indonesia in facilitating more sustainable waste management strategy or how HPH is doing different with other hospitals in Indonesia? Yeah, I think uh, uh, nowadays uh, we call it a shifting because uh, our current uh, supporting the, for the HPH to the all hospital in Indonesia is uh, how to prepare uh, to the, for the health educator uh, training, you see. This is most probably, and then also to how to bring the hospital uh, access to the accreditation and national or international accreditation. Because 
one of the points of the accreditation needed is how to uh, make the health education and also the uh, family and also uh, to the environment around the hospital. This is your uh, issue current. But nowadays, after the COVID situation, we, we would like to uh, expand about the value chain, you see, about the, how the hospital should maintain their staff not to giving the services to the COVID patient without any protection from the bar, uh, barcode and offer code, you see, like that one. And the other issue is there is no emergency case for the uh, health staff professional to share for the uh, COVID patient. This is uh, the issue, uh, two issue, big issue uh, for the uh, health professional uh, should be supported by the HPA. Then other, and there's the, the HPA also facilitating for the a national regulation uh, to uh, preparation, good preparation for the uh, standard operational procedure. Uh, because we know that severity among hospitals in Indonesia quite uh, quite uh, 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 wide, and then it should be maybe we are staying in the mainstreaming uh, about the, how to make the uh, because it's quite different in the west side and the east side uh, about the hospital situation. So that's why this is the role of HPH uh, on bringing the. Uh, hospital were prepared and then protect for the health hospital staff in the COVID outbreak, I like that one. All right. Thank you, Dr. Suraman. Another question for you. Um, uh, a participant would like to know why currency exchange have an impact on the waste management cost. Is it because a third party was hired to do it? Yeah, and then we know that the volume of the uh, uh, infectious uh, waste from hospital quite big, and maybe also separated between the the, uh, the infectious and also the COVID base, uh, COVID based waste. So in to but uh, to case of this, maybe the the the, the price uh, from the third party to be, become more higher because they should bring uh, more more faster, you see, than uh, than before uh, than the infectious letter. And the other issue because the currency uh, situation. After the economic crisis, past uh, uh, pandemic, we should make it higher. Maybe before the COVID, uh, yeah, okay. the rate yeah. of the rupiah to dollar yeah, is around uh, thousand. Yeah. But nowadays, it's about the yeah. eighteen thousand. You see, it's just really a problem. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Suharman. Now, um, another yeah. question. Um, the next question is for um, Mahesh. All right, um, Mahesh. What is the function yes, yes, of yes. the question is what is the function of biospore and chemical integrator in the waste container? Yeah, I think uh, uh, I think uh, Hori has a little clear on this issue. Basically, basically uh, when we put in contaminated waste in the container. Uh, when we are doing autograving, we have to make sure that that contaminated waste is being decontaminated. So if you put a spore or the chemical indicator, it will give us a give us a uh, idea about whether the waste uh, uh, disinfection has been properly carried out or not. You now, if the test fails, then it means the waste has been not disinfected. We have to do it again uh, and properly. And if it is uh, the test is passed, then the Waste is properly disinfected. This is a proof of the waste injection. That's why we have to put this testing indicator inside the inside the uh, containers and uh, check it later after that uh, after the finishing the autograving. All right. So it Thank is already you. mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yes. Okay. So I, there is another question about the waste and autograving, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mahesh. Um, now, uh, the next question. Hey, one, one more question. Oh, all right. Um, so they saw in your presentation. Oh, okay. the yes. Uh, were the workers also disinfected afterwards? We saw them already mingling with the other officers. Oh, they, 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 they do disinfect it. They are not mingling. This is just a, this is just a photograph taken quickly during the thing, this is not, uh, they, they disinfect and their, their, their PP is disinfected and also the, they, 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 they themselves disinfect it properly. That's, that's the basic minimum thing we do. All right. 
Um, let's move on. So uh, the next question is for Dr. Jorge. Um, doctor, are you recommending autoclave treatment compared to other treatment technology? And are you re recommending healthcare facilities to have their on-site hazardous waste treatment? Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Can you hear me? I'm not sure. Yes, doctor. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, autoclave is... Uh, if you go through my list, all the other ones are extremely expensive, and the ones that are affordable are the autoclaves. They've been used for more than 100 years. We know about autoclaves quite well. We've tested hundreds of them. They, they all work quite well. And we even make them here in the Philippines, for example. And I even designed one myself in Africa, so they, they could be used. The, ones I, the one I designed for Africa is the one I brought with me to Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia during the Ebola uh, outbreak. And so it's a very effective technology. And as Mahesh was explaining, uh, if you put in a, the endospore, you need about, you, usually you start with about 10,000 CFUs per mil. And then usually we, we have those, uh, those vials that when you're able to destroy a little bit, it changes color because of a um, a re reactant that's put in, in the liquid. And so it can immediately tell if it has worked or uh, if it hasn't worked and you need to do it for longer. Um, or the chemical indicators, which, uh, which will tell you what the temperatures are inside of the, the bags, for example. So it's a very effective technology. And uh, yes, I do uh, recommend it both on site or even large scale. But I am very much against uh, what the what some international agencies, I understand, okay. like EV even, uh, are promoting incineration for COVID-2 when in fact it is not needed and it will make the situation worse. Autoclaves, yes. Incinerators, no. All right. Got it, doctor. Thank you very much. Um, I think there's another um, very important question. So it's about um, healthcare uh, waste management in the Philippines. So, doctor, in your assessment of our Philippine current hospital waste management, how are we faring from the rest of the ASEAN region in terms of um, hospital hazardous waste management? That's the first question. So, and the second question, I'll just put it in. Um, would you cite a good uh, would you cite a good practice from NCR National Capital Region in terms of hospital hazardous waste management? Um, okay, well, I, I've uh, visited many countries in Asia, and many are really working hard on improving their health waste management. The Philippines uh, has one advantage. We have the health waste management manual. We've had one dating back quite a number of years now. I think the first one was about 2004 when I was first involved, and the last version, I think, is 2012. And so there's been a lot of training. And so if you have a combination of all that, have policies, have good training, um, disseminate that information, and then uh, get hospitals to have healthcare waste management committees uh, uh, to uh, put in technologies or to have contracts with uh, treatment facilities, then you, you have a good system. And I've seen a lot of good systems in the Philippines. I visited... Uh, uh, quite a number of St. Paul hospitals of Sister Arce, and they're good examples. Uh, I know in Manila there are hospitals that have their own treatment facilities, like the Hydroclave or um, and autoclaves, such as I think East Avenue Medical Center and um, various uh, health centers. I think have uh, a good examples. I personally worked on uh, yeah lung centers at the Ana. Um, and then outside Metro Manila and quite a number two. Um, Vietnam has also done a, a good job. I, unfortunately, I've never done an evaluation of Indonesia. But so, so there's a lot of work going on. And that's why what I'm saying is when the DNR, EMD, put out a memo saying basically to bring back incinerator, I was quite surprised because we already have a good system in place. And so what the COVID epidemic should simply do is give us another incentive to continue to enhance and improve our existing healthcare systems, not bring in an old technology that could 
uh, do even worse uh, damage to us. All right, thank you very much. Um, so we actually have so much questions. Are we still, do we still have time for more? Sure. I think we have room for two more questions and then before we wrap up. Yeah. All right. Um, so whoever from our panel of speakers would like to answer this question, just, just um, yeah, just say it. So wait, let me look for it again. Um, so can, can someone from our speakers would like to answer? Um, a, a participant would like to know how to disinfect respirators for reuse, for example, the N95. Um, I, I, I can try to take a start on that question. Uh, a respirator, you see, because we we uh, we we are separate. Different place is different uh, concentrations of the uh, of the corona and different the facility and the, the amount of we will divide it into the se uh, separate. Maybe this is the national standard as already as already put uh, the guideline based on the WHO recommendation. So that's why. We know that the, the, the situation of COVID is among the airborne and also the, among the droplet. So that's why it is quite uh, different because the, uh, the, the size of the uh, filter, the filtration is below than uh, 100 uh, nano uh, micron. You see? So that's why it's the, uh, the difference like that one. Yeah. All right. Dr. Hardware, you'd Hello. like to add? Something? Yes. Um, uh, this has been something of concern to me. Um, it is highly recommended that any hospital that is doing any of the aerosol generating procedures, such as mm -hmm. intubations, uh, both invasive and non invasive mm -hmm. ventilation, mm -hmm. even um, the use of um, um, uh, what do you call them? Um, medication, aerosolizing medications. Uh, need to use N95s and face masks. Uh, that is the recommendation. As, and as, uh, uh, as Dr. Uh, Surman mentioned, uh, actually, uh, the definition, although I don't completely agree with it, is that anything below five microns would be considered an aerosol and above five microns would be considered a droplet. The thinking is that if it's above five microns, most of the droplets would because of gravity, simply fall to the ground, whereas the aerosols get suspended in air. And therefore, if you're doing some procedure that's creating a lot of aerosols, you could end up breathing it. Now, the face masks, many face masks are not capable of dealing with aerosols. The N95, the N99, and the N100 masks are the ones that are capable, although you cannot find N99 and N100 too many. In Europe, we call it FF, uh, FFP2 and FFP3s. Uh, in China, I think it's called K, K95. There's also a KN100. Uh, so the, the, the N95 is a NIOSH uh, uh, category. This is what you need when you're doing aerosolizing procedures. Now, keep in mind that the way this works, the way these masks work, is not the way we normally think of filtering. In fact, in fact, the holes in these masks are bigger than the aerosols. The way these operate is through a, a different physical process called um, diffusion. Um, and so we need, and that's why they are made often in the micron, submicron levels, the fibers that are made to do this. And many of them have an electrical charge. The reason I mention it is because if you're going to reuse N95s, and you're going to use, say, steam, or if you're going to use, say, uh, uh, bleach or any of these others, you could actually degrade the ability of the N95s to protect you from aerosols. They're still okay for, for droplets and for general use, but I would recommend as much as possible to use new N95s and face masks, uh, face shields, when you're doing aerosolizing uh, generating procedures. Uh, that's my take. And in, ter in terms of the 
uh, technologies, the ones I had mentioned, oxidy steam, uh, and so on. The, the other ones that do not destroy too much the properties of the N95 are UVGI, but that's very difficult, and most hospitals do, do not have that. That's ultraviolet germicidal irradiation. Uh, the other one that's also useful that doesn't destroy much of its properties is vaporized hydrogen peroxide or plasma hydrogen peroxide. If you have that equipment, you can use that and it keeps most of the properties, but most of the others would degrade so, uh, many of the properties of the N95s, so you have to use it more cautiously. All right, thank you very much. So for our last question, it's addressed to Sister Arce. Uh, Sister, do you have uh, a comparison of volume of hospital waste generated before the COVID situation and now? How much different are the volume and likewise the type of waste generated before and now? Uh, actually, Pastor, we have not uh, compared. We just finished our waste audit last January, if you remember. And uh, since we have a specific area for the COVID patients, that's what I presented earlier. Those are the, the waste generated in that area. So we presume that in the other areas, we have the same volume of waste that we have been generating. Because all our COVID uh, patients, even for the suspect or the probable, are all confined into an area. So you should say that uh, the the volume of waste in the other areas. Besides, we have also a fewer number of patients this time as compared to the previous months. All right. Thank you very much, Kuya Paeng. Huh. Right. Um, thank you very much, um, Pat, and also thank you, uh, Sister Arce, Dr. Soherman, uh, Mahesh. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, also, uh, Dr. Jorge Manuel, uh, for all of you who imparted uh, your experiences, your stories, and your expertise on the discussion uh, subject. Um, for this afternoon's um, webinar. Um, certainly, it imparted a lot of knowledge uh, to all of the participants uh, who tuned in today, uh, both in WebEx and in the social media platforms that we're also using. So just to wrap up the discussion, discussion this afternoon, um, I'd like to go back to what we keep saying, you know, especially here in the Philippines, that COVID-19 is first and foremost a, a health problem. And the reason that we're facing a lot of other problems, economic, transportation, food shortages, um, commercial, labor, um, whatever, you, whatever else we have um, issues, is that for, it's for our failure to outright um, address um, COVID-19 as the problem or failure to recognize um, COVID-19 for the problem that it is. And we have to also think about this. Um, uh, I hope that during the discussions this afternoon, this also underscored uh, the fact uh, of the, the oath that all of us here in the health sector um, took an oath to when we uh, have sworn, uh, the Hippocratic oath to do no harm. No? So the, all the discussions that we are having this afternoon our efforts uh, from our health sector partners, uh, health institutions that are doing their best you know, to respond to the, the health problem that is the COVID-19. And all the measures that we're putting in place are all there uh, to not to, uh, uh, to lessen or reduce the harm that's being done by COVID-19. And incineration or waste incineration as a response to the products or the waste that's being produced in our response to managing COVID-19 would not be in alignment with our oath to do no harm, as discussed by Dr. Emmanuel, that it would uh, uh, expand or it would aggravate the problem that we're already having by adding, uh, by exposing us to other sorts of uh, pollutants that would harm our 
um, health even further. So um, with that, I hope the, the best practices uh, that were imparted by our um, um, presenters this afternoon from Nepal, Indonesia, and the Philippines, and especially the lessons that we learned from Dr. Jorge. I hope it has enriched your um, um, knowledge, and I hope that some of those you can practice in the hospitals or the health uh, sectors that you, or health facilities that you work with. Again, um, all of the discussions that we had this afternoon um, has been recorded. Uh, you, uh, we will um, all give you a link uh, to the recordings. And again, also all the presentations that our panelists uh, shared with us this afternoon, are we're going to collate them and also give you a link to those presentations. So um, I'd like to thank again um, all our presenters, um, Sister Arce, um, Dr. Soherman, uh, Mr. Mahesh Nakarmi, and Dr. Jorge Emanuel. And also, I'd like to thank all the participants who tuned in today and also watched us in the social media platforms that we made this uh, webinar available. Um, I hope you all have a nice day. So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to every one of you. Please keep safe, please stay safe. Uh, to the extent possible, please stay at home. Thank you very much, and we hope to see you again in our next webinar. Do keep in touch. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye. Bye.